Hello and welcome, Monogame fans, to another Dark Side of Monogame. Uh, due to pop it down, I'm going to start off with a few getting starting videos and sessions now. Uh, we're going to get started with the basics of 2D, then we're going to move on to actually show you some frameworks and engines in later episodes. And getting more into the 2D world, we'll then probably pause, have a quick recap of some more frameworks and engines and things that have been pointed out since the last frameworks and engine session. And then we'll probably end up going into the world of 3D. But anyway, we're here today. We're going to go through 2D. And as I always recommend when you're starting out with game development, if you're new, don't skip over the 2D part. You might think, oh, I want to build a new 3D Quake or Doom or Destiny or whatever. But getting a firm grounding in how you do 2D, how you do drawing, how you get things presented on the screen, how draw sorting orders things work, and how the whole game update loop works is critical. Start small, work more. So what we're going to cover in this session is very high level. We're going to just do some very basic things about how to get started, how to get things open, get them running. Uh, we're going to talk about the actual update loop, which is how games themselves work. There is a constant loop which goes on in the project. We're going through the old content system, how we can get content in, load it, draw it, get the works. Uh, we'll cover some input handling and we're also going to cover doing some audio and hopefully that's going to come through on the video itself. Not we're not going to do everything, so we're not doing physics, we're not doing collisions at this point in time. This is just about getting stuff on the screen, getting it working. And I'll give a few pointers and things as we go along. But hey ho! And then we'll finish up with a few little extra things. Uh, another part I've added to this session and uh, is simply around also about game state management. So how you build and manage your project itself. So going from menu to your game to pausing and things like that. And also it links into the game state management sample that comes from the old XNA Game Studio library, which is now all hosted up on my archive, which you can also get in and Dig around. There's loads of samples there and they're slowly being consumed and updated to monogamify them, as it were. And I do them as and when I can. Anyway, let's get on. So, basic concepts. So, you want to make a game, you want to get into game development from the start. And well, everyone has these big grand ideas I want to do this, I want to do this. And as the old adage goes, it is better to start learning to walk before you run, and it certainly is true when it comes to game development. And there are still things today even I struggle with, them because uh, there's more advanced areas and things. Getting you grounded, make sure you're set for how you're going to get on, is key and important. Now, a few key concepts if you're new to XNA or Monogame, uh, we have these kind of terminology pieces which sort of set the stage for what is Monogame. So we've got the game, which is may sound simple, it's it's the game framework, it's what XNA or monogame calls a game. We have the graphics device, well, actually that's your graphics card, that's what's drawing to the screen, presenting to the screen, controlling how the screen works. We have what's called a sprite batch, which is a, a batching process for sending 2D or graphical content to the graphics card for it to be displayed. Now these are important because you can have different batches for doing different things. You can apply different effects to different batches. I'll explain a bit more as we go on about that. And but it's in key to know the fact that when you're sending textures or images to the screen, you're batching them together logically and then sending them on to be drawn. Hey ho. Right, we also have the content manager. I briefly covered this in one of the previous sessions, but for anyone who's new, the content manager is simply your, your asset pipeline. It's where you're going to put all your content into into the project. You're then going to pull it from there to load it. It's going to be cached. It's going to be managed by the manager. It's also managing types and things like that. So it's the way you get assets into the project. You can, if you want to, bypass the content manager and just load them directly, but they won't be as efficient and you potentially lose some build time advantages of using the content pipeline. If you refer back to the content pipeline session I did where you're building extensions and how you're, you can twist content as it's coming in. So taking one set of data and turning it to many before your game runs. Obviously, every, in every game, you're always fighting to make sure the fact that it draws as fast as it can, it 
updates as fast as it can. So you don't want to do any complex processing. You can bake or put these things into the assets, into the game as you build it instead of when you're running it. I was keen to know the fact that there are several constructs which are core to almost any game development language and modern game is no different. So you have vectors, which are uh, elements which dictate whether something from 2D and 3D, 4D. So there's refs and things. You've got rectangles, so it's a little bounding space on the screen. And obviously you've got textures and audio and sound. And lots of other little things, which we'll cover some of those today. And then you've got the actual game loop itself, which broken down to several key elements. Now to better sort of detail this, is that, you know, we have the initialized portion. This is when your game starts. This is where you're setting up your scene, how you're getting things ready, loading content in, getting things done. You then have your update loop, which then you're handling any input, applying physics, changing positions of things on the screen. And then you have your draw loop, which is where you then say, right, now draw. I've updated everything else, draw. And then this goes in a, an eternal cycle between updating where things are to drawing them on the screen. Update, draw, update, draw. And that goes on and on until your game stops. That's key to note the fact that you only have one update loop. Uh, there are some tweaks you can do, especially with physics. If you want to do more than one update per loop, you basically have your own update loops built in with the update loops and you can get the whole infinity effect of how those work. But bear in mind the fact that you're fighting for performance at the end of the day. So for every update, you're delaying or potentially taking time away from drawing something. So it's a fine art and balance between how you do things. Anyway, we'll go into this more in a few more examples. So, throwing stuff on the screen. Obviously, 2D is all about painting the screen. You know, that uh, you can do various funny effects with this. You can apply depth by having images drawn at different lengths behind the screen. But it's still 2D. And it's simply like, if you look at the old age animators, you know, the drawing on screens, it's the same thing. You're painting the screen presenting it and putting it on there. Now, one of the key critical things, especially when you're drawing to the screen, is the draw order. The, the, rate, the way you paint stuff onto the screen will determine its visibility and whether it's overdrawn by something else. I mean, there's magic that happens in the background with graphics cards and things where it makes sure it doesn't draw things that can't be seen. It does a lot of things. Uh, but effectively, you can think of that if you have a piece of paper and you draw an image, and they draw something else over that, and you draw something else over that, then obviously each is going to overlay. So the order in which you say you want things to be drawn is important. So if you draw your background first, then your character, then your effects, and anything else on top, and you're all good. If things aren't being drawn the way around you want, just look at how you're drawing things. You know, it's very, it's very keenly important. And the other part of this is where you're drawing it. Now in Monogame, it uses a simple coordinate system where the top left hand corner of your screen is the start point for everything. So that's zero, zero in 2D space. So that if everything you're drawing is then across our x, our x axis and down on our x, y, y axis. So it goes up in x and down in y, which might sound a bit odd, but as soon as you get your head around it, it's perfectly fine. Now as you're drawing something on the screen, I'm saying draw it here, right across and down, not up. A few times when you're trying to work out things when you want to draw it up, it's that it's a case of working out where the bottom is and then how far up you want to go. It's quite simple. You'll get used to it. It's very, very easy. Just bear in mind, when you get to 3D land, it all bets are off. It's completely different. But for 2D, you're talking about screen space or the screen point and where you're actually drawing it from that top left-hand corner. What you can also do when you're drawing things is also apply effects on these things. So that you can say, fine, I'm going to draw this image, but then I'm going to draw this one, but I want it to blend with the background. Now, I'm not going to go into this too detail. It's just so you know that they're there. Because there's a lot of work in going in and making these work. Uh, there are a lot of things which are called shaders, which can also change how things draw on the screen, how you can affect the entire screen, what's in there. Where effectively, Monogame comes with several built-in ways of changing how you draw things to the screen. And it uses the sprite batch to do this. So that you can batch things together and say, right, I want these drawn, but I want them to blend together. I want these drawn, I want them to hard overlay with each other, and so on and so forth. 
this is there's a world of things here and I'll make sure the fact that the next set of samples that are upgrading on the XNA Game Studio site are the effect ones, just to make these a lot more clear and link to them on this video. But there's a lot there. That's something worth knowing what how they work and how it can affect how things are drawn. So now that you've actually got things on the screen, it'd be great if the user can actually do something with it. You know, press a key to make something happen or change something that it some effect or simply having it so it's a nice thing that's animating across the screen. Now with input it's a case of every single update you're simply checking what is the current state of the input and that's any input that you've got in the system whether it's the keyboard, whether it's a gamepad, whether it's a mouse, whether it's a touch screen, these are all different types of input and you're checking and testing each one every single time you're going through the update loop. Now Happily, Monogame abstracts all of the complex nature of all the different platforms that Monogame supports down into the effect of the old XNA Monogame language, how you describe input. A keyboard is just a keyboard, no matter which device you run it on. A touchscreen is just a touchscreen, and so on and so forth. That's the same for any and all sensor inputs that you can have on the machine. When you're checking this, you're simply saying, has the state changed from what it was previously, or does it meet a new condition? So have I pressed a key? Have I released a key? Am I holding a key down? And you're checking what that means. And what a lot of games do is they actually also track not just current state, so something someone's done, they're also going to track the previous state. So my, my key is now down, was it up in the last frame? So I've just pressed it. Or if it's down in the current state. Is it was it down in the previous state, which means someone's holding it, thing like that. So there's a lot of things you do. You can check. Uh, you can always do more or less. It's up to you. Best advice is going try things as they do. And with animation, okay, so 2D drawing on most PCs and stuff. It's no just like going to the movies. Things aren't really actually moving. All you're doing is saying, right, draw it here, draw it here, draw it here, draw it here. And then you're fooling the brain to think it's actually animating across the screen. And there's def several different ways you can do this. And uh, some of the frameworks and engines, and we'll cover this in sort of the next session, is that provide frameworks to do this. All you're really doing is saying, right, here's an image, or here's a group of images, and I want you to do this. And it could be as simple as putting a ship on a screen, and then moving it across or it could be a set of animations which are actually looped together to form an actual animation which you see on the screen so there's lots of different ways of doing these things and if we look here nice little thing so we've got a single image which i can then just move around the screen or you might have a what we call a sprite sheet which basically is one image with lots of images on it for the same thing just like in like your cartoon animation where you're seeing things move, and you can see there's different frames for what happens to that image, and then all you're simply doing is then playing them over on the screen. It gives a nice little animated effect. Now we won't go into this now because there's too much there's too much to implement that. And so you can do it yourself, it's quite easily. Um some of the samples that are on for the monogame.samples have these built in. So the platform 2D's got real good sprite sheet implementation of showing it. And you can roll it yourself if you want, but I'd probably recommend using one of the game extended or proto game or one of the other game engines, which actually already has this built in. Simply because there's so many different things you can do with animations, it's better to use something which is dedicated to do it. But learn the basics yourself, know how it works, then apply it. Simple as that. Okay, so audio. Audio is like any other content within the system. And it comes in effectively a couple of forms within the framework itself. You've got sounds, which are sound effects, uh, which have also you can create instances for more control over, which just far and forget. You also have what are called songs, which are background music, which will show in the sample itself to go through. And as it goes, you can these can either be like far and forget, uh, loop them, change them, do them around, apply effects. And there's different ways and different course of doing things. And the best thing to look at for audio is simply just look at examples, look at samples, how do they work, what they do, and how you get out of it. Because audio itself is fairly basic. You can get into more complicated scenarios with like 3D audio or 
stereophonics audio to control in which ear it's coming out of. Well, those are really dedicated things that we're going to do. For most games, if you're looking at a tablet or you're looking at a phone, you don't need all that. You simply need to be able to play sounds in the right way, in the right order, at the right time. And like anything else, it's a case of don't tell another system. If you try to play 500 sounds at once, your phone is not really going to do that. It's going to go bleh. <laughs> in effect. Anyway, so they're the basics. Feel free to watch over that again and go through. I, probably, I do tend to talk about fast because I'm trying to get things out, out as it were. But now let's switch over and actually look at the actual code. So here we're going to build a very, very simple game. We're going to throw some assets in. So we're going to throw some images. We're going to draw them in different orders, different positions. And then for the last thing, we're going to show, throw some nice little audio effects in just to get a basic grounding in 2D games. So let's have a look at the code. All right, so we switch up to Visual Studio. You can, as you can see here, I'm using Visual Studio 2017. And we're going to go and create a new project. Bear in mind that, obviously, if you're using 2017 on a clean machine, you must at least have a minimum of at least the 3.6 point release or the latest dev release to get that working. Let's do a few minor little things. So I'm going to go here and create a brand new game. And you see here, it's got the starting project, we've got our content project, and we've got our game class. And this obviously has everything that we talked about before. So we've got our graphics device defined. We have a default sprite batch. We've got our initialize and load contents because they're only launched once when the game runs. And then we've got our update and our draw classes which perform the old game loop stuff. And if I just run this by default, we'll get presented with a nice old XNA Confar Blue. There was a debate uh, some releases ago to make this the new Monogame game Orange, but I don't know what happened. Uh, I think someone lost the draw and we didn't change it anyway so let's start off obviously to get going we need to have some content in here so here's our content project i can open it by just double clicking on the content project i'll just launch it manually by lowering this little pipeline and it's there installed in your machine and here's some content i prepared earlier so here i've got a nice little ship i'm going to go and draw this in And there's going to be the option to either copy it to the director or just I think I'm going to copy it in. And you'll see here by default, obviously, it's, it, ha it sets up all the proper texture imp importers. So it knows it's a sh an image. So it's setting as a texture. There's some other options here. You can look into it later if you feel wish, but if you wish, that's all fine. So it's all in. Then I'm going to go into my project. I'm going to create a new reference for my, to hold on, onto my image. Call this my ship. And I'll go down to load content and I'm going to pull this from the content pipeline. So I'm going to say ship equals content, which is my content manager. I'm going to load and then I need to tell it what type of asset is I'm going to load. In this case, it's picture 2D. And then I need to give it a name. Now, the handy little trick here is if you're in the content pipeline, you can right click on the actual name and you do copy asset path. And this will give you the actual string to put into your content loading line very simple if you have folders in your content project it will also include those and then make sure it all works as it should do and i can just paste it in and then i'm going to just simply just draw this to the screen so for drawing i'm going to need a sprite batch and for working with sprite patches you need to begin it so say you're getting ready to draw images i need a sprite patch dot draw to actually draw the image I want to draw and then I need a sprite batch end to say I've finished drawing and can you send all this lovely stuff up to the graphics card. If we look at the draw card we've got several different overloads here of how to do different drawings in different ways. Obviously there's different use cases for using each so here we're just going to use the, the very basic one where if they're going to draw my ship I'm going to draw it at vector2.0. So if you remember from the slide where we're talking about the coordinate system, that's the top left hand corner of the screen. And by saying zero, it's zero, zero. And then I'm going to apply a color tint. 
Uh, this is, can be quite useful if you've got images which you want to have different colors and just draw them on the screen and you can either create separate images for that or you could simply apply a tint to it to change the color. I seen that used with some uh, body parts and things like that in some games. But setting white it back means no tint, don't change it. So now if we go and run this, we should hit a nice big error. Now this is, I point this out simply because this is by far one of the most common issues you're going to come across with your content. A modern game is basically complaining that it can't find the file that you're asking it to import. But we go to our content manager, yes it is, but hold on, we haven't actually saved it. So if I save my project, it now knows there's the file, it knows it's going to import it, it's going to include it in the build and pass it along. So now if I simply run this again, it's going to go and find it and then draw it to the screen and we'll see a nice little ship hanging there in the background. I can't do anything with it, you know, there's no controls or anything else, but it's there drawing on the screen. That's something to watch out for. If you add, if you added an asset and you can't find it, the simplest reason is usually that it's not in your content project, the file name is wrong, or you forgot to save. Right, so we've got one image in, I'll find two, but I'll ship, you know, on its own, it's not really interesting. So I'm gonna I'll go and also add in a background. I'm going to do the exactly the same here, and you'll see this repeated a lot of times uh, when you're loading content because you're just pulling it from the content pipeline and saying, right, this is what I want, this is where I'm going to put it, and you know, off you go. And again, I'm going to go over, I'm going to, uh, oops, let's put our background into the project. Here, nearly made in the second mistake. Copy it in. I'm going to save, and then, oops, I'm going to, oops, uh, copy that one. I'm going to say oh, background, and then I'm going to go here. And I'm going to, I'm going to go right and draw my background. I'm going to, for simplicity sake, I'm going to draw exactly the same place. And color that works. We don't change. Color. Let's save that and run it. Now, running this now, we're running into obviously one of the most basic things here. If you look at the code next to the game now, I am drawing the ship and then I'm drawing the background. Obviously, the background is completely overwriting the ship. It's a much larger image and it's drawing over what's there. So. And it's pointing out here the draw order that you draw things in is extremely important. As you can see now, if I reverse this and draw it in the way I'm supposed to, so I've got background obviously should be at the back, and my ship should be in front of that. So if I now run this, I'll see my ship nicely drawn on top of my background. So again, it's pointing out you know, the order in which you draw things is important, and it's also to make sure that you, you draw it in the order you want it presented to the screen. It's also true if you're using any kind of blending effects and things, the order that you draw the blended effect in will affect how it works. All right, so let's give it further. Let's also have some text, because obviously that a ship in the background, fine, but what's going on? Now, text is handles what's called sprite fonts. And the content pipeline has full support of what the sprite fonts are. And what these effectively are, here we are. I'm going to call it my uh, default. And if I simply open this up, I'll do a notepad because it's just a text, it's just an XML file at the end of the day. Ah, oh, no, that's horrible. Let's open up something a bit more. Friendly. So I've used Visual Studio Code. If you've not used Visual Studio Code before, download it, get started. It's brilliant. Ah, Visual Studio Code, your color coding. So you can see it's a standard uh, XML file. This is the standard format we use from all imported XNA content. Uh, that's used in Monogame. We use the same style, of course. And then here you can simply say we are a font description, which means we give it a font name. Now this font comes from your machine. If you've not got the font installed, it won't build. It's quite simple. 
uh, the size of the font, spacing, any kerning or what style to use, and also the character regions out of that font sheet to use. Now, if you recall from the previous video I did, you're working with the content pipeline, you can mess with this to change how sprite fonts work. If you only need characters A to Z, just get those. If you only need A and B for some strange reason, you can just get those. There we go here, we save it and we'll do, you can also build the content in the pipeline itself to make sure that there's no issues in the actual content before you're building a project. It's always a good tip there to make sure that the content's fine before working on your project and figuring out what's going wrong. So here we've built our sprite font and again it's the same logic here so we're going to create a reference to it. Put my font. I'm going to go down here and I'm going to load it. Except this time, instead of a texture, I'm loading a sprite font. And again, and just because I don't like typing, I really hate typing, I'm going to copy us a path and paste it in. Now, when we're drawing text, the sprite batch has a, an extra little overload function for this. It's called draw string. It simply is XNA's way of actually drawing strings within a sprite batch because obviously sprites are a 2D effect that we're actually drawing themselves. And again, this has loads of lo lovely little overloads, but the simplest one again is simply to say my font. I'm going to again draw it as vector 2 sort of 0 because it's just simpler for now. And whoops. Ah, I read my description. That's all right, my text. So my <laughs> game. Hey, this is live coding. I'm just coding on the fly. There we go, another zero. And also the color. And just for argument's sake, I'm going to call this, I'm going to put it as yellow. Yellow on a blue background sounds like a good plan to me. So now if I run this, I shall have my background with my ship drawn on top of that and also my awesome game text drawn on that. Now if you want different size fonts in it, you have to change that in the sprite font description itself. There's no huge overhead with fonts, it's compiling an actual image of the image fonts going to use and it's a case of if you need different sizes then you just need to have different sprite fonts for different sizes. Generally speaking you don't really need to scale it. You can scale this if you want, you can draw your screen to what's called a render texture which basically means instead of drawing to the screen I draw to an image and then I take that image and I draw that to the screen and I can scale it how I wish. Uh, that's a nice little trick to do when you're working with multiple size screens to do that. So we've got our text, we've got some background, we've got a ship but again I can't really do much of this game it's very boring so Let's actually add some interactivity and input in here. Now to pull data from the machine, you simply need to have a state. So whatever device it is, uh, whether it's a keyboard, whether it's a gamepad, whether it's a touch screen, you simply need to be able to code to say, do this when doing this. And if you look at all the rest of the monogame samples, either on the XNA Game Studio archive, where we've got migrated samples, or on the monogame.samples repo itself, you'll see vast different ways of handling input. You know, by default here, the template comes with a way of saying, check the gamepad, is the user pressing the back button, check the keyboard, how are they pressing the escape key? And that's one way to do it, but there's, there are slightly better ways. So what we want to do first is, if we're going to control the ship in its position, then we need to be able to track what its position is. So I'm going to say ship. I'm going really bad with my casings here. Now, ship position. I want to make sure my ship is drawing using that new position. There we go. So I will draw my ship where my ship is supposed to be. And then down here, what we want to do is start capturing this input and then altering where that ship's position is. Now, what we recommend generally doing is you create a vector of where things are going to move. And it has a, a beginning point. So I'm going to make changes to the position, and this is what the change will be. You can 
change the position directly, but you can get to a bit of a mess there if you've got multiple inputs trying to all work together to change how something's working. Okay, and then so we're going to alter the movement based upon what's coming out the keyboard. So I'm going to say a keyboard state equals keyboard get state. And that's going to get us the state of the keyboard at this current time, in this, this update loop. Uh, what some games do is they also track the current state and the previous state. So you can see, has a button just been pressed? Is it being held? Is it being released? And things like that. But for the simplest sake, say, we just want to actually get out what it's doing. Then what I want to do is then start making choices on what that is. So if in the key state is the key down of... Not what, for Okay, so this person's holding on the right hand side key my movement dot x. So my x position across the screen, I'm simply going to add one, and then I'm going to repeat this now for the rest of it. So as we're going right, uh, I'm going to say I'm also going to have going left. You notice doing it this way as well is that if I have both the left and right keys pressed down at the same time, then it's going to simply subtract itself away and it's not going to happen. And okay, let's complete the picture here. Let's also have a keys dot up, not you, up. And then we're going to change the Y. Now, if I'm going up, remember, because this is the Y is actually down the screen. I actually want to take away from the Y. So I'm going upwards, which is negative movement. And then in reverse of that, if I'm pressing down, I'm then going to increase the Y. And lastly, what I'll be able to do is actually changing the play movement based upon what I've changed it. So I'm going to say now my ship position. Uh, this movement vector. This can affect where the ship's drawn on the screen. So if you're going to check on, say, um, a gamepad, you do this up here, or if you're going to check on touch, and you'd simply alter what this movement vector is, and then that's going to update where the pos ship's position is. Um, plus or minus, it's just going to move around the screen. And then we we simply test this now. And we go, fingers crossed, I wrote my code right. So my ship's drawing, my ship position. My ship position's been altered by my movement. And hey, look, there we go. Hey, wow, look at that. Isn't it fantastic? But again, as a game, you know, moving your ship around the screen's a bit boring as such, really. But anyway, I'm holding two keys. Yep, a bit boring, a bit dull. So let's try and add a bit more now. So again, let's go back and add a little more content. And I went and created this lovely little bullet. There we are, where it is. Add that into the project. I'm going to copy it in. I'm going to save. I'm going to build. I know my shot's built. So uh, I don't forget. I'm going to copy this. And again, we're going to repeat the same thing again for just getting the asset itself in. So I'm going to have my texture of my shot. This is encasing. And I'll load in my shot. Another texture. I personally usually roll these all together so you can see which one's which. And I'll paste its name in. Okay, that's our shot in from a content perspective. I'm just going to tighten up. Let's keep all my textures together. So, I'm also going to need to know where I'm going to put this shot in the screen. My ship position and my shot position. Don't say that after a few trinks. So, what we're going to do now, if the simplest thing we can do is we're going to say, we're going to simply copy our input code. 
and we can simply say if the space bar is down, you know, we want to be able, we want effectively to draw our shot and put it on the screen. So if we go down here and we simply say then subscribe back to draw my shot. Not short. I'm not, I'm not drawing my shorts on the screen. That's not, not going to work. I'm going to put my shot position and let's call it color white because we don't need any tinting or anything like that. Oh, well, and do. But obviously, here in the moment, that's just going to keep drawing it no matter what. I've not pressed space, I've not done anything. So, we need something to be able to track has the player actually shot. So, what we also want is a simple pool. Has shot. Uh, you don't have to set a boolean as false. It's just good practice so you know when you're reading it that's what it's supposed to be when you start. And then what we're going to do down here is that if they've shot, we simply need to say has shot equals true. And down here, then we can say if has shot, spelling this right, then it's only going to draw it on the screen when I've shot. I can only say a shot when I've hit space. Seems good. Run that and here's our ship happily on the screen, hit space and nothing happens. Why is nothing happening? Or if it is, it's probably because it's now drawing somewhere else on the screen. But anyway, I'm trying to draw a shot, trying to draw a shot, but obviously it's not moving, it's not going anywhere. No. We want it to actually do something. So what we basically firstly need to do is we need to say we have to set the default position to where the shot needs to be. So we need to say the shot position equals ship position, you know, simple enough, it, it, you know, we want to draw the shot where the ship currently is, so if the player is moving around, that's where it's going to draw the shot, nice and good, but obviously we also want it to be able to move, so there's some nice little code here, I'm going to do this, just save me some typing, so if players has shot, We want to say move the, sh the shot across the screen and also as a nice little extra test is the fact that we want to say if it goes off the screen, so we're checking the graphics card, the visible space or the viewport and how wide it is. So if the shot is gone beyond the screen, then it's not, you've not shot anymore. That means you've got one shot to go, nice and easy and off it goes. So now if we go around, oh, have I set the keys wrong here? I didn't change the key! <laughs> if you don't change the key, it's only going to work off what it is. No one it wouldn't work before. Anyway, so, <laughs> so I pressed down the shooting. Interesting. Well, here's where we start to look at some of the more interesting things now. I've got my ship. Right, in the position screen, I'm going to hit space and it's going to shoot. But you notice it's shooting from the top left hand corner of the ship. Now, this is simply because, again, everything's working off the top left hand corner. That's where zero is. So I'm not actually drawing the ship in the center of the ship, I'm drawing it in this top left hand corner. So I, the, you could spend ages trying to work out and manipulate things, how you're going to do. But the easiest thing to do is to simply say, right. If you want to draw something in the position of something else, then simply apply apply an offset. So you're saying draw it here, but just down a bit. And so the simplest way to do this now is we're just going to say for the shot. I'm also going to have another call, vector 2 called shot offset. Uh, but also we need to set this up 
after the ship is loaded, because obviously this ship, it could be any size, uh, any dimensions, and we, and we don't want to be destroying anywhere. So we need to calculate what the shot offset is. Based upon the content itself. So we want to say it's actually the ship dot width start by two and the ship height start by two. So that will give us the center of the ship in theory. And then what we actually can do then is say fine. So when we actually say our shot position, we're going to actually say in our plus our shot offset. It's going to start in the top left hand corner and move it down a bit so it's towards the middle. But this isn't the end of the story still because positioning it. So we have an image, but we don't necessarily know where the center is. It could be a bit elongated, it could be tall. And if you notice if I hit play, even though I'm going to the center of the image, it's not quite on the center. It's actually towards, it's down a bit and across a bit. So we still need to pull it in based upon the image. Now, Again, you could have another offset, another way of doing it, but it's simply a case of it's simply manipulating our offset around. So I'm actually trying to say, here I'm going to say is that move it 30, 30 points outward so that it actually moves away from the center of the ship. It's actually outside the ship from the shooting. You expect it, you're shooting from a gun that's not in the ship, it's outside the ship. And then I'm also moving it up slightly because the center of the image isn't where the center of the ship is or not where I want to do it. So by actually just manipulating this shot offset and then lining things up, and you'll find this a lot when you're working with different images, different sizes, and how they generally work. And then now I'm shooting from roughly where it are and the screen is going across. Fine. There's our ship. It's shooting something all well and good. But it's a bit quiet, a bit dull. So let's add some sound. Now, sound wise, we're going to do two things. So, first, I've got a nice little, little shotty sound. And when I pull this into the project, it's going to set it, it's going to recognize it's a. a so, if I check on this, you can see the fact that it's important. It's recognize it's a wave file, so you're using a web importer. There's other, you know, there are MP3 and other sound effects you can actually do. And let's just save and build that. So that's working, that's built fine. I'm going to copy my asset name. And again, as before, it is simply a case of just declaring what it is. So I'm going to have my Sound effect. Obviously, this requires another namespace within. You need to use the audio namespace within XNA, which is not added in one game. <laughs> Wrapping the files. Five pounds in the jar for swearing XNA. And I'm going to call this my shooting sound. I'm going to go for a really long name this time. And exactly the same pattern as before. So, uh, equals, cont again, constant pipeline dot load. I'm going to have my sound effect. Ah, put my name in and then save it. And there, that's my sound loaded, ready to use. And the great thing about sound effects is they're pretty much on their own. It's just fire and forget. So the only thing I need to do here now to make this work is simply say shooting sound dot play. And that's it. That's a sound effect. It'll, it'll play the sound for as long as the sound runs, and that's it. If you need more control over it, then you'll actually need to use what's called a sound a sound effect instance. And to do that, I'd actually have a sound effect instance. Uh, I'm just showing you for completeness, and I would actually say. And that's it. And then this instance has lots of other different properties here. You can loop it, contains the pitch, contains the state, 
Uh, you can even do 3D values on it, but seriously, it's not looking at it, you can do, and also change the volume. But we're not using any of that. We've just got our ship sound, and when I play, and that's now here's a test of the recording capabilities. Will we hear the shot? So I'm going to go down. Are you ready for it? Isn't that fantastic? That's my awesome shooty sound. So great, we've got our ship. We can move around. We can start shooting. Almost a thing. We've got honestly the thing that really makes any good game is some thrilling background music. Now it's a good thing to note here just the different ways that different content can be loaded. So I here I have I've got a nice MP3 for a battle theme. It's a nice dramatic piece of music that really gets the blood boiling when you're going into battle. And you can see here now it's using the MP3 potter and also it's actually changed it now so it's a song. Now songs are important because th what the way they work is they're working with framework to play music in the background. So that's built and then we can actually get into our project. So I'm going to copy it here. And I just need to make sure that I'm actually loading it as a song. Because a song has different ways of loading within the project itself. So I'm going to go. So I'm going to declare my song. And for this, I need yet another namespace because I'm using media, not special sound. And background music. And again, like everywhere else, I'm going to simply go background music or content, load the song this time. And I'll leave the name of my file. I did copy it, but I just got rid of it. I'm a copying fool. Now, for playing this, it's a case of it's going to be running all the time. And we're not actually using most of the background we're doing. So, we're going to actually use what's called the media player. All we're doing here is simply saying to the, and the system that we want to start playing our background music. Now the key thing here is the media players, you can only play one piece of music at a time, you need to stop and play something else, and it's basically just using the, the hardware's own media playing system to actually play the music rather than actually being in the game. Uh, it allows you to pause and play and do other things. But that's going to do it, now if I run that, now my game's going to kick off and run, and it's going to be playing up awesome background music. Isn't that thrilling? There we go. The shot the music together. Ah, I forgot to actually set it so that the player user can shoot. I'm going to paint that. I'm sorry, no, you can only have one shot at a time. So you can only press space if you can only shoot if you're not shooting already. Whoops. If you're not shooting already, there. Sorry, I'm the... it's a bit of scope creeping my project there. I'm sorry, no. I'm not allowing any rapid fire in this game. You can shoot, and you can't shoot again until you finish shooting for three. Or you might have three shots. And you'd have a collection of these things, and it's running, but there you go. Very simple 2D game skill, but granted, there are a lot of other things you'd need to do to make this to a full game. Yeah, you need to have like collision detection so that if the shot hits something else and it would do something, and you have some enemies and lots of other things shooting on the screen. You might have more than one play, you might have more than one shot. It's completely up to you. But anyway, so that's a basic 2D game thrown together. And let's see what else we can do. Alright, and we're back. So, what about going on from that? So we have our single game, it looks great, I can press buttons on the screen. But I've only got my single game screen. And this is what most samples will show you, is that here's something there. That Something there doesn't make a game. You know, you need to be able to manage how these things go together, have menu screen and stuff like that. So, what to do? Because at the end of the day, you've only got one game loop. You know, it's constantly running. There's no, oh, well, hold there and go off and do this now and do this and go and do this. No, you've got an internal loop going. So, what we apply to this now is we apply what's called game state management. And it's simply a simple 
case of it's a, like a state management system of saying, right, I'm currently the game is currently in this state. I need you to draw this and update this. If I'm now here, do this. So we say, if I'm in the main menu, right, this is how I draw the main menu screen. Right, you're in game mode now. Go and draw the game. If oh, someone's hit pause, here's the pause screen and what it does. And it's very keen to make sure they get grounded in the basic framework how this all fits together. And Microsoft Rails was a fantastic sample of this. It's called the Game State Management Sample, which is one of the first that we've updated on the uh, XNA Game Studio archive. And this shows you simply a case of a very simple way of managing all the different states in your game. It also has templates for what is a menu, what is a game, what is a pause screen. And also has some very basic input controls as well for adding buttons on the screen. Granted, they're all very basic, and you need to go off and do more to it. You need to go off and do more on it and actually apply you know, effects and animations and things like that. But it gives you a start. It's a very good start, and it also has different ways for different platforms for how it works. You have to remember that you're in one game loop and you're saying, what am I doing now? So we'll switch over and I'll show I'll walk you through the sample that's on the XNA Game Studio site and just show you the key important part of what makes this sample so great of just showing you how to build the game. Okay, so back into demo land. Game state management is extremely important and obviously the XNA framework also had lots of samples around this. And here we've actually got the converted game state management sample on the XNA Game Studio uh, archive. And if we look into this project, uh, this has been set up specifically for obviously showing off modern gaming in all the platforms that's currently supported. There are a few more here that are not, uh, not much visible at the moment, mainly because they've got our private repos like the Xbox, the PlayStation, the Switch. And well, most of the ones you're going to use are here. We've got each of the platforms set up and we've got the actual sample code here. And the way this works is if this sample provides you a framework for managing multiple screens throughout the lifetime of your game and in here you're going to have like a must main menu screen you're going to have pause screens game screen things like that and if i simply run this project i'm running it in the desktop gl platform at the moment we're going to have a nice little framework here now everything is managed in this sample so we've got inputs we go through menu options if I go to play game, it's then going to transition with a loading screen off to the actual game itself. And you can see here, there's my ship flying around the screen. If I hit escape, it's going to break up a pause screen. And then I can either resume the game or I can quit and go back to the main menu, along with prompts and books. So there's tons of stuff here, even a little option screen. And if we, get, okay, if we close this now, and I exit, I just want to exit. And we have to look at the code. We can see how this is all made up. So we have our main screen manager. And we've got a load of boilerplate code around how this all works. And if we look into our platform, in our platform we've got, you know, there's our content and we've got our screens. And you can see we've got loads of screens set up all within the sample. And everything's simply managed. I simply say, right, here's the screen. It has a main menu, it has a background, it has these entries on it, and it's worth just simply digging through this and how this all orchestrated. If we look at the actual game class itself, when we're starting our game, you can see here I've got my screen manager, I've got my screen factory, just for how it's going to build screens, uh, and they're adding these into the actual component system of the framework, and then I'm simply going to add my initial screen. So if we go to this function, you can see here, I'm going to add in a background screen, and then it's going to add in the main menu screen. And then this is what you're seeing. And this is layered drawing within 2D for the game itself. But then look at the main menu screen. I can see here that this, this is simply made up of, I've got three game options, I'm just, and they're just menu entries. I tell it what happens when I select that option. That's where they clicked on by a mouse by a keyboard, by a gamepad. This is all built in for you. And then I'm simply adding it onto the screen. Dead easy. You know, the background that's been drawn there, all this simply has 
is it's got some images so i'm loading a background image and then i'm just updating and drawing so i'm, so I'm saying update the screen and i'm also then saying just draw the, the background texture i'm actually having some different effects in here built into it and you're controlling what you want to do with it and it's quite easy to get around you can see here if i go on to here if i once if i selected the main the actual game selected start i'll just create a little function in here and then here it's simply saying right well load the loading screen and then once the screen's finished loading then load the game playing screen and then that's where all my game is and the game is obviously then whatever you want to do which is what we covered in the last session section where we got our update loop we got we got a section for handling input it's all code strictly put out you can see it's the same kind of code we used earlier so we're altering the movement and then changing where the player is we're doing all our drawing up the top we've also got our initialization so we've got our setting the scene and then we've got loading content into the game and so on and so forth and it's worth just looking through this and see how it's all put together and the whole screen manager part of this we go back down here this controls the state it says what state am i in now what where am i going what screens are actually active in the, in the scene at the moment loading unloading and it handles it all for you so it's worth looking through it how it works and you'll notice the fact that you know this in itself is a library in its own so you can reuse this in your own games and projects simply copy the portable class library put it into your project and then you simply need to follow the same steps here as having the game initialization define your screens feel free to copy some of these as a template if you want to and so on and so forth and it's that simple to get going so very quickly using this library losing this as a template you can get your own little game project up and running in a snap and i do mean in minutes once you learn how this is all put together so let's finish off this section and get back to the presentation okay so that was building a game and actually having it ready. So now you can see that you're taking a simple game, adding a menu, and you can do stuff with it. And it's, it just works. So, where else can we go? So, sort of round off this whole 2D experiment. I mean, granted, you look through this, there's a fair amount to absorb if you're new. So, feel free to go back, rewatch it, look what's going on. And, you know, once you're happy, you know, you, you've got a good steadfast of how you do things. I'd recommend. Go up and try build your own little 2D games. Take your favorite assets, put them on the screen, try drawing them in different ways, just to see how that works and make sure you, you're comfortable with how that works. But where to go from here? So there's loads of documentation around the 2D drawing space. Uh, if you look at the monogame that rocks documentation space, then there's lots of decks. It's still a bit of a work in progress, but it, there's a good start in there. Uh, there are also uh, links to a load of tutorials on the monogame.rock site, so you can look at other tutorials people have made. There's quite a few good series there. Some of them can be a bit old, but it's a case of if it's written for XNA4 or if it's written for monogame, then it's going to put you in a good stead for monogame. It just makes sure that's the minimum requirement you're looking for in these tutorials or documentation. Keep an eye, I mean, keep an eye on my Twitter and things like that, or even the monogame Twitter handle, monogame team. And they're always switching up new and interesting things that come over. We've also got the sample repository from the XNA Game Studio work side, where I've archived all the current samples and we're in the process of trying to monogamify them. So the game state management sample you'll find there in the monogame samples section, and there's a repo just for that sample. So you can easily pick that one out and go off and do it. And of course, you can follow my channel. And I no, it's been a bit sporadic of get of late getting videos in. There's lots of things going on. I've got lots of balls to juggle, as it were. But I'll try and keep on a steady pace of getting new videos out in, in the regular intervals now to try and sort of curb any concerns. And you can find that on YouTube there. Mostly, if you found it here, you're watching it. So that's it. That's sort of a quick roundup of 2D. I hope you've enjoyed watching and happy money gaming. And of course. Solidarity, brothers and sisters. I shall catch you on the flip side. And on.